All right. Well, good morning. Praise the Lord for this wonderful and beautiful day that the Lord has given to us and this opportunity, the chance we have to worship the Lord together on this 177th homecoming for Mars Hill Baptist Church. We've been here 177 years. Give ourselves a big round of applause for that. We thank the Lord for each and every one of those years, and uh, what a blessing it is to be able to be together to worship the Lord today. Um, last year at this time, um, homecoming, last year was the very first time we had met in seven weeks. We had had seven weeks in which we had shut down uh, because of the pandemic, and as things had progressed, uh, we had this homecoming uh, celebration last year, which we were able to open up the church. I know uh, many of y'all were, were there and part of it. We had the pews, uh, every other one blocked off. We were all wearing masks. And uh, there was a grand total of 37 of us that day. But we came together and we worshiped. And what an amazing and wonderful opportunity that is. And uh, what a blessing it is um, that, that we were able to do that. But here we are a year from then back together. It's so wonderful to see each and every face um, that is here as we celebrate the church, as we celebrate our Lord and Savior, and as we spend this time of fellowship together. Let me welcome uh, each and every one uh, through our Facebook live feed. Thank you so much for tuning in. We do think, uh, pray that the Lord will bless you through our service today. We're so glad that you have decided to drop in and and be a part of our service this morning. We have a, a lot of things that are going to be going on. It's a jam-packed service. Um, but you know what? That's a good thing. Because God is good. All the time. Good. And all the time. God is good. So uh, this morning, please uh, put your eyes in the, in the bulletin. We've got a lot of things that are going on um, just within uh, the next, uh, next couple of weeks. Um, please don't forget the camp casual deposits uh, as uh, we'll be going to the very end of July uh, this year. We're looking forward to that. Um, all that information is there. Also, Sunday school will begin again June 6th. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So glad uh, at 10 o'clock on uh, Sunday, June 6th, we'll be starting that. If you're anxious and you want to get back to Sunday school just a little bit quicker, uh, Doug and Sharon Riley, the adult two men and women's class, they're currently meeting uh, for Sunday school in the choir room at 10 a.m. So all those that would like to be a part of that certainly may. Uh, love, they'd love to have you just for that time of fellowship and learning God's Word together. Also, please don't forget the church's internet is uh, up and uh, alive and well. If your internet perhaps goes out at your house or you have something very important and you want something uh, to come and, and be stable around and uh, be able to you know, do a Zoom meeting or whatever it is, um, we had somebody this week actually doing that. Um, the the Wi-Fi at the church is certainly open. Just give us a call. We'll get the door open. And you can be a part of any of the, the Sunday school classes. You can be in there, set up your laptop. We certainly uh, would welcome that. That is what it is for. Uh, Six o'clock for all the men. We are meeting uh, in the uh, fellowship hall. Actually, we're meeting in one of the Sunday school classrooms right now. Uh, for a men's Bible study, no more excuses. Uh, Tony Evans' study is a great study if you want to be a part of it. We welcome you to come out 6 o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, also, through our online, uh, both our um, website and also Facebook, 
Um, and also YouTube, we have a Wednesday night Bible study that I'm posting. We're going through the book of Ecclesiastes. If you'd like to tune in for that, um, those are also getting, uh, getting posted as well. I'll encourage you also, uh, read a little, just a quick little article uh, in our bulletins, uh, Reaching Our World for Christ. I adapted this uh, from an article by a gentleman by the name of Russ Reeves. He wrote this for the uh, North Carolina Baptist.org. And it uh, talks about reaching our world for Christ. And I thought it's very, very interesting to think about what exists just within a few miles of the church. Um, so I'll encourage you to read that as well. Um, also, another big, big announcement um, is in your bulletin. This is Vacation Bible School. We're aiming to do it starting July the 21st. And uh, the theme is Destination Dig. This is Lightways. Um, we had an opportunity and a chance. You think about last year, we weren't able to meet together. We're trying to do that again this year. And what we need are a lot of individuals willing to work and put in the time and effort to be with the children of this area, to reach them for Christ, to be able to uh, allow them to have this wonderful uh, vacation Bible school. Um, so I, I would encourage you to look over all of this. Um, Kendall, do you have anything you want to add about, about Vacation Bible School and what we're trying to do? I would just like to um, verify that it's an outdoor Vacation yes. Bible School. Yes, we're trying to do everything outdoors, um, so that way you know, kids will uh, feel safe and uh, parents alike. That might actually appeal to, to more individuals. We're trying to do it outside, so go ahead and start buying your sunscreen now. Uh, I would suggest gallon jugs. <laughs> Um, but please, please, this is a tremendous opportunity, a chance to touch the hearts and lives of other children. And, you know, I, I put it in the article there that within a two-mile diameter, a mile radius of the church, there are almost 800 homes. And I don't know how many people that actually goes to, but you know what? There's a lot of those individuals that don't have a church home, that don't have a relationship with Christ, that have children within them that would absolutely love to be a part of Vacation Bible School. And I think, you know what? Those are individuals that we're called, that we were called to all the way back in 1830 when we kind of formed uh, loosely, and then 1834 when we became a church. We're called still to that mission field to go and reach those souls for Jesus Christ. So please be in prayer. Look at your calendars and say, you know what? I am I'm utterly free. I want to be a part of this. We need all sorts and all manner of, of workers there um, to make this a success. Um, also, you'll notice these very lovely flowers that are in front of us today. These flowers are placed in the sanctuary today to the glory of God in an honor of Rick and Linda Lloyd's 50th wedding anniversary. We want to congratulate them. We are, uh, we are so grateful for them. You think uh, 50th, uh, a 50th wedding anniversary is a, such an inspiration. Um, I think about uh, the fact of um, Rick and, and Linda and Alice and I, we actually share a, a wedding anniversary. And uh, we didn't have our 50th. Um, <laughs> I'm glad y'all laughed at that. Um, but you know what? I, I look at it as an inspiration um, for every couple. Um, we go through such craziness in our life to have a beacon of hope like that and say, you know what, 50 years ago, that is a testimony and, uh, and a triumph and, uh, and, and such wonderful, uh, wonderful testimony of the faithfulness of our God. So we, we congratulate you on 50 wonderful years. Um, this morning, looking through all of um, everything we have here, are there any other announcements, anything that I have failed to, to mention here today? Well, today uh, I wanted to start off our, our service a little bit differently. We've got a lot of things going on. Um, many of you know uh, Jennifer uh, Pearl. Uh, she has been coming right since February. Since February, and um, she's been a part of the Zoom Sunday School class. She's gotten to know a lot of y'all, and uh, really been taken with the church. 
and she's excited about trying to find a Sunday school class uh, in the weeks ahead to open up Sunday school. So I'm going to ask you to come on up. And, um, and she has uh, told me a couple weeks ago, she wanted to do this last week, and um, was a little under the weather, but uh, here she is. She wanted to join the church. And um, I wanted to present her to you. Um, she would be transferring membership from Andrews Memorial. I'm still right there. She'd be transferring from Andrews Memorial Baptist Church, having been baptized there. And uh, interestingly enough, the same water that baptized her baptized me. We were baptized in the same night. Um, and uh, she is a dear friend. And um, she is before you, church. So who, what is uh, the church's pleasure? Oh, yeah. All right, I'm going to take it as first and second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. We got a new member. So I'm going to encourage everybody to remember that right afterwards and make her feel very, very welcome. So praise the Lord. Now we start off the service on a wonderful, good, and happy note. So let us bow our heads in prayer as we commit this time to the Lord and give thanks to our Heavenly Father. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you and thank you so much. For 177 years, this church being able to be here, we thank you for the years that we celebrate here and the wonderful work that you have done in the hearts and lives of drawing individuals to be members here, of allowing us the opportunity to minister in your name to this community, to do a good work in the name of Jesus Christ. And now, as we gather here together, we pray in your Son's name that you would visit with us, that you would draw us close within your presence, that we would glorify you in all that we would do. For it is in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Please stand to your feet as we have our responsive reading. I haven't been able to say this in a very long time. If you'd like to, you may reach into your uh, pews and grab a hymnal. It's a hymn. Uh, the number is 145 for our responsive reading. Uh, but you also can notice the words on the screen that are before us. As we have this responsive reading, and then we'll go directly into our congregational worship of how great thou art. Great is the Lord. Most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. There is no one like you, O Lord. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. There is no one like you, O Lord. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. They will tell of the power of your awesome works and will celebrate your abundant goodness. There is no one like you, O Lord. Let us unite our voices in song as we sing hymn number 147, the first and the last, of How Great Thou Art.
ABC. This morning, as we go to the Lord in prayer, we do have many that are before us on our prayer list. Um, one in particular uh, that you'll notice is added on um, is uh, Dr. Adrian Miles. If um, that name sounds familiar to you, um, the reason is um, uh, Dr. Miles, my cousin, actually uh, spoke here uh, for our adult BBS one night. And uh, I know many of you were, were telling me how wonderful she was. Um, Dr. Miles is a professor at Southeastern College in, uh, in English. And uh, we received word in, uh, a while back that I hadn't been able to kind of publicly say this, um, but uh, she has announced that she has cancer. Um, and is currently going through chemotherapy and radiation and all um, in fighting that. Um, so I would ask that you would lift up Dr. Miles in your prayers. Um, she, uh, she is fighting and, and is taking everything just so, so graciously, looking to the Lord for, for healing and health. Um, so if you will, please remember her in your prayers. Um, also continue, if you will, to remember Russell Bateman. Um, he was admitted to the hospital. They were able to um, kind of check out everything that was going on. And um, his heart is fine in respect so he had that heart transplant. So um, the, the cancer and all that he is battling um, hasn't affected that. But he is in a great deal of pain now um, as those tumors are upon his back. And um, he does have, uh, he is dealing with that. So. Um, I would ask that you would continue to remember him. Um, they did do biopsies. They'll be getting uh, more information in the days ahead uh, about what they could do in respect to radiation treatments and all. Um, so if you will, please remember uh, Russell and all of his family in your prayers. Um, also, if you would remember, um, I, I just received this uh, this morning, probably about 9 o'clock or so, um, if you would remember the father of Debbie Smith. Um, I, Debbie is, uh, is married to the pastor of Smithwood Christian Church. Um, Smithwood Christian Church was the very first church that I ever pastored. And um, their pastor now is actually uh, an individual I baptized. Um, we've met, and Debbie is sweet. She is uh, from Oklahoma, and she messaged me on Facebook that uh, her father um, has diabetes. His, his blood sugar went up above 400, um, had a seizure, has gone and ru been rushed to the hospital, and is dealing with an aneurysm, and um, they're still waiting to, to get a little bit more information, but I know Debbie is very, um, very upset at this because he is in Oklahoma and they are here. Um, so if you will, remember the father, Debbie Smith, in your prayers, please pray that the Lord would um, would give, give help in their hour of need. Um, also, if you will, continue to remember Alan and Keisha. Alan and Keisha have been here a good number of times. Um, Alan continuing to battle cancer as well. Pray the Lord's hand would be upon them, um, giving them help uh, in this situation and help, um, uh, help and healing. Um, in guidance now. Um, th this morning, is there any other requests that we can uh, we can lift up in prayer? Yes. Yeah. Can your Bob and Helen stray home? Most of the congregation knows them. Their only daughter lives in Asheville, Susan Barber. She has been fighting cancer and taking treatment for cancer for a good while now, and is sleeping most of the time now. So keep that in mind as well. Okay. So remember. Susan Barber and uh, battling cancer now is Bob and Helen Strayhorn's daughter. Um, pray the Lord would, would give healing and health both to her and the family during this difficult time. Who else can we remember today in our prayers? Yes. Uh, Whit will be going in Friday morning uh, for some more tests on his um, arteries in his neck. Remember Whit Walker in our prayers going in for more tests. 
protest on Friday and feeling the arteries on his neck. Pray the Lord give healing and help in this hour of need. Who else can we remember today? Yes. Remember, Kristen and Chuck, today they're, they're going to be moving to Charlotte. Kristen did tell me she's going to be watching us on, on Facebook, so if uh, it is on live feed, live feed, go on and, and wave at them. Um, let's pray that they can give safety and this would be a smooth transition as they travel today. Who else can we remember? We look out into the world today and there's great need. Um, we're grateful for a ceasefire that's occurred in Israel. We are thankful for where we are at in as a nation in dealing with the pandemic that has been occurring. Um, we are grateful for the blessings that God has poured out upon us. And we also realize there's so many, so many difficulties that the world is facing now. You know, even as we look at the myriad of, of, of requests that we do have before us today, as we look at the many things that we are battling, one thing that we are absolutely and completely certain of is this, that our God is able. That there is no problem too difficult that he cannot solve. There is no battle too great that he cannot win. So as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, let us remember who we go to, and let us go forth with great expectation. Father God, as we come before you today, we give you thanks and praise for your love, for your power, your grace, and Lord, for your continual presence in our life. And humbly, we come to you to lift these requests into your hands. Lord, you are able. You are able to meet each and every need. You are able to give peace and healing and help and hope. And Lord, that's what we do right now. We look to you and pray we'll go with you. We pray that you, by your mighty power, would work in the hearts and lives of each and every one of the requests that have been made known that are upon our hearts now. We lift them into your hands and with great expectation. We ask that you would work knowing that we would receive an answer in due time. Father, we praise you. We worship you today. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, this uh, morning we do have uh, a very special treat for our uh, children. I hadn't done this in a long time, but all of, uh, all of our children are going to invite to go ahead and, and come up. And we're going to do on the right as opposed to the left. And rather than me talking to you this morning, uh, Sam Merrill, our special speaker, is going to be delivering our children's sermon today. So we're going to, you get an extra special treat. You get to actually come up, but you don't even have to talk to me now. So that's even better. So please uh, feel free to come on this side. It's all good. And I'm not trying to light you on fire. I, I, I promise it wouldn't be all right. I, unless. Um, <laughs> so audience, is this on? Here we go. Make sure it's green. It is green. There we go. All right, an audience of one. Sorry to single you out, but everyone else can listen to. Um, Melody and I actually used to be, we had a church in Kenya that was just for children. And so the sermon was the children's story. So the most important things in the sermon are going to be here, right? So I, I want to tell you, and I'm just going to talk to everybody since um, uh, we're so few, um, about an experience that I had as a kid. And it's a story about a kind of homecoming, like we're celebrating here today, but it was a little bit complicated. So I grew up in Kenya, that's in East Africa, and I went to a boarding school at some point because there were no schools around my house. So we had to go off uh, a distance from our house and live at the school, if you can imagine that. 
Um, and we, we met people from all over Sub-Saharan Africa who were students there. Um, and you know, Africa is really big. You could fit the United States into Africa three times at least. And so some of these kids were from Zambia and Malawi and what was called Zaire at the time, all over. And so one of my roommates was from Zaire. And we decided at some point that I was gonna go home with him during vacation to see where he lived. Well, that wasn't easy. It wasn't like you know getting in the car and driving down the street. It involved two days and three flights on a Mission Aviation Fellowship plane, a six-seater Cessna. So I left Nairobi, that was the capital of Kenya, and I flew over and landed somewhere in eastern Congo, which is Zaire at the time, then I flew to another place and spent the night, and then I flew the third flight. These are all three or two or three hour flights. I flew all the way to the northern part of Zaire, next to Sudan, where my friend Tim Stow lived. Well, it was, it was really cool, because you think of Africa, you think of something like jungle. Well, in Kenya, we've got grasslands and savannah, but in West Africa, in the central part of Africa here, it was jungle, so it was my first time to see the jungle. And uh, Tim had a motorcycle, and I loved motorcycles. And so one day I was out riding that motorcycle, just down the dirt road, past the village houses. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of a chimpanzee chained up next to one of the huts. I knew that there were chimpanzees around, but i would never been up close to one. Uh, we had all kinds of other monkeys we grew up with, but not chimpanzees. And so I, I stopped my motorcycle, and I turned around, and I came back to this little hut, and there she was. Oh, she was the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. She was sitting there, she was about two years old, weighed about 40 pounds, and she had rotten little front teeth, and she was tied up with a chain. And so the people in that village spoke Swahili, and I spoke Swahili. And so I asked them, well, how can you have her tied up? And they said, well, the truth of chimpanzees raided our garden, and in running them off, they left this one behind. This was some, you know, a while ago. And so since without her mother, you know, she would just die, so we just kept her here. And I said, can I buy her from you? And the problem is I had no money. <laughs> <laughs> well, they said, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I have a Swiss Army knife, and I have a watch. And they took one look at that, and they said, sure. So I handed over a Swiss Army knife, I handed over my watch, and I, she, she wasn't shy. I, I got her, and she grabbed onto me like this, and I drove back on the motorcycle to the Sal's house. Well, I got there, and they said, well, <laughs> now, these, these people, they had a chip of their own. It was an eight-year-old called Rosie, and she, she was uh, something to be reckoned with. You, you didn't get in Rosie's territory. But Samantha is, ended up calling this little one Samantha Sam, right? Yeah. Um, and she was just young and, and, and uh, a baby, you know. Uh, chips don't mature until they're 14 years old. Wow. They're just like children, seriously. They, they learn by watching and all sorts of stuff. So they said, well, what are you going to do with this thing? So I'm going to take her home. And they're just speaking to me. And they said, but you know, you have to fly across international borders. I said, well, that's OK. I'll figure it out. Hmm. Well, I went to a vet in, in, in this village. And, and he said, well, she needs a rabies vaccine. So we gave her a rabies vaccine. Anyway, I stayed with her for several days and fed her mangoes, and then the day came I was going to go home some weeks later. Well, we, we showed up at the plane, and the missionary pilot took one look, and he says, are you sure about this? I said, yeah, yeah, she'll be fine. I'll, I'll hold on to her. Well, we hadn't gotten up in the air very long before, you know, she got antsy, and she started, I was sitting right behind the pilot. She started grabbing his headphones and I was trying to hold her down. And, you know, and she would try and bite me if I held her too tight. So I had a bag of mangoes over here to keep her busy. So we got kept her busy until we got to this other mission station where we had to spend the night. And I, I, I got this idea like, look, 
for this next leg, we're going to have to stop, and the customs official is going to have to come out to the plane to see, uh, you know, what's going on. And I don't want this. If he sees her, you know, we're going to be in trouble. So I was trying to do something that wasn't quite right. Anyway, I went down to the hospital where we were at at this mission state station, and I, I talked to the doctor. I said, "So, what do you give children to sedate children?" <laughs> you know, like um, I, I don't need to put them under, but just to make them quiet. Right? He said, "Well, we usually use phenobarbital. It's an injection." I said, "Well, can you give me one of those?" <laughs> he said, "Why?" I said, "Well, because I have this chip, and I need to sedate the chip while we're." He said, "Okay." So he gave me a shot of phenobarbital. So I'm 14 years old, right? So I, I, I spent the night that night, and I. Uh, and the next morning, the plane was going to come, and I jabbed her in the butt with phenobarbital and gave her the injection. <laughs> Thought everything was fine. We got on the plane. This pilot wasn't as nice as the other one. But anyway, he didn't say much. Well, uh, you know, we got on the tarmac at another airstrip before taking the jump over Lake Victoria back to Kenya. And now the customs official comes out to the plane. And I somehow managed. She wasn't asleep. I managed to hide her. Well, the thing is, that phenobarbital didn't work. The whole trip, she was, you know, anxious and whatever, and, and she wasn't screaming, thank goodness. Long story short, which has gotten pretty long, <laughs> uh, we got to Kenya, and I'm making my way through the, this is a small airport, so not the big one, but there was a customs guy, and he, I was trying to hide him. He says, what do you have there? And I said, oh, it's just a chair. He said, just a chip. What, what is this animal that you have here? And I said, it's okay. I'm just, I rescued it and I'm bringing it to the primate institute. I just made up a story. <laughs> I'm bringing it to the primate research institute that's near my house. He says, well, that, that's illegal. You, you don't have an entry permit. Well, I had a vaccination certificate in French that he couldn't read, so I produced it. I said, yeah, here's my import. He, he said, well, you, I, don't, I can't read French. I said, well, it says that I can bring her in. <laughs> I got in the car. We got, oh, he first, he said, uh, you know, you can't bring this, this animal in here. I'm sorry, you have to surrender. I said, okay. So I knew that if I took her off of me and stretched her arms and put her down, she would start screaming bloody murder. And she did. Right there with all these people around. And he said, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so I got her back. Off we went home. Now, I hadn't really thought about this, if you can't tell already. <laughs> what are my parents going to think? <laughs> you know, Mr. Ralph and Miss Ross. <laughs> Can you <laughs> imagine Miss Ross with a chimp in her house? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It was nighttime by the time we got home. And I, I knocked on the front door because it was locked. And my dad comes out of his pajamas. And I had this chimp underneath my big, I had an army kind of a coat. And uh, I, he's, he was so happy to see me that I was home and safe and reached out to hug me and he said, what, what's that? And I opened up my coat and there she looked up at him. And you know, I was expecting him to be really mad. Like, what are you thinking? You know what he said? He said, well, look a lot. <laughs> and you know, he, he, he said, okay, I don't know what's going on here, son, come on in. And he welcomed me home. Well, over the next 24 hours, we realized I hadn't thought through this very well. The next day, he took me to the Institute of Private Research, and they took her away. Uh, and it turns out we had given it uh, the wrong rabies vaccine, which is a lie vaccine. We're not supposed to do the primate. So it had to quarantine for a month to make sure it didn't have rabies, et cetera. Anyway, you know what sticks with me in that story? Is that my dad accepted me with a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I hear I'd gone off and I was coming home, and I came home different than I had left. And it wasn't what he had thought about, and it wasn't really what I had thought about. But he accepted me and loved me, and he he helped me through my next steps to know where I should be headed. 
So I'm really grateful for a father that uh, took my monkeys and took me all in the same breath and loved me anyway. And that's what I want to leave you with this morning, is that God accepts us however we come. Now, there are consequences sometimes, and, and it's complicated sometimes, but God loves us and we never have to doubt that. Thank you for enduring my long lives. <laughs>
morning is John 13, verses 34 and 35. The Lord Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. May God bless the reading of his word as we meditate upon it.
come and be with us, a friend and a friend of the church, and, and to so many here for, for so many years, so Sam, come and deliver the Word of God to us, and I'm going to get to do something I haven't done in a very, very long time, and that is sit right beside my wife on Sunday morning. So thank you for that <laughs> opportunity as well. It is great to be with you this morning. I have to say that in all of this year and a half, uh, the opportunities that I've had to speak to congregations have been in a little box. So I'm a little bit overwhelmed here. There have been two occasions where I've actually got to speak to live people. But thank you for inviting me uh, today for homecoming. Um, as I thought about it, I'll be honest with you, um, other than a few times here in the States, homecoming is a relatively, I didn't grow up with it. Um, we had in Kenya what we call Founders Day, which is, you know, you celebrate the founding of the church. And our church weren't, our churches weren't 175 years old. Uh, usually they were within living memory of being founded, maybe 25, maybe 30. And so it was a time of celebration where we came to just praise God for the establishing of God's family here on earth through the church. I guess if there was a, a theme that I would like to weave in this morning, it would be about homecoming can be complicated. And, and truly, the, the children's story was a part of my sermon um, in, in, in a simple way of saying it. Homecoming can be complicated. Um, I don't know, these days, you guys all, many of you have had kids coming home. Um, and you know, it's interesting, when our three boys come home, Everything changes. Uh, suddenly, the cables on the back of the TV get disconnected and there's a PlayStation that starts going. There's, there's stuff that gets strewn all over the place. There's three dogs, a St. Bernard, an Australian Shepherd, and then our Golden Lab, and, and the hair just starts flying. And, and, and suddenly, you know, meals appear, or, you know, people don't think about how they appear. And dishes, you know, suddenly, well, somebody else is going to wash those dishes. And, and quite frankly, before too long, I began to wonder, well, whose house is this? Uh, but this year, we had an antidote to that kind of complication and chaos in the form of our COVID granddaughter, Ray. And so along with all that chaos comes this little individual who gives and receives love. And it reminds us that what about what is the most important thing in our family, and that is the giving, the receiving, and the expression of love. And so all of that other stuff that I mentioned, including, I might add, the thermostat. <laughs> I mean, before you know it, somebody has messed with the thermostat. But Ray makes it all worthwhile. You know, as I think about homecoming, my mind goes to homecoming in my family. You know, we traveled a lot. We moved around a lot. As I mentioned, we went to boarding school. Those were not easy things, going back and forth to the States, to a place that was strange to you, coming back and things had changed. A uh, boarding school that you didn't necessarily want to go to, but that you had to, because that's where the education was. Um, those, those times of going away and coming back were formative in my life, because in the context of those times, what was demonstrated to me was that it isn't only a place and a house with furniture that is your home. It's the, it is the demonstration of love by the family that creates home. I mentioned to you this boarding school. I went away in 10th grade. I promptly ran away from boarding school. Um, and the first time I got to come home was a little bit by force. And I came home and locked myself in my room and I vowed that I was never going back to that boarding school. Nothing really bad had happened. It was just simply I didn't want to leave this place that I knew was home. Um, a long day of weeping ensued and me running out the door down to the forest and my dad following me carefully and gently saying, son, come back, come back. And at the end of that day, we're all in the living room and there was no way out, folks. I wasn't going back. It's just, that's all there was to it. And my 
dad, after hearing and pleading, and my mom, after crying for what seems like hours, my dad stood up and he went over to the phone. And I said, what are you doing? He says, well, son, you know, your education is important to us. And, and it's important to me that you're happy. And so if it's necessary, mom and I will resign. I will work here in Kenya. And we'll take you back to the States where you can get an education. Well, something in that moment switched for me. Because love was demonstrated right there. Uh, it wasn't just about me anymore. It was about my parents giving up what, what their calling was because God had also called them to family. Um, that was a conversion for me, even though I believed in Jesus already. Suddenly, in my midst, it was demonstrated. And God gave me the strength to go back to boarding school, uh, to, to uh, be homesick for a bit, but I, I survived. And you know what? When I graduated from NC State, I went back to teach at that same boarding school. And you know who sought me out? Those kids who were homesick. And suddenly, it came full circle, this, the trial and tribulation that I had gone through, and I was able to assist somebody else because I recognized. So those are the things that come to my mind when I think of homecoming. It's that difficult, complicated, but uncompromising demonstration of God's love. Scripture is full of stories of homecoming. We don't have time to go into them all this morning, but I would ask you when you get home to just read the story of Jacob and Esau and the homecoming that Jacob, uh, shall we say, in trepidation, endured because he knew where he had come from and under what circumstances. I would ask you to think of the prodigal son <coughs> um, and to think of that homecoming and apply it. Homecomings are complicated. In each of these stories, there's a, an intense struggle and barriers that need to be dealt with. Um, they require meeting halfway they require compromise. They require standing firm, a holy forgiveness, and an accommodation of the other. And each story is undergirded by love. So I encourage you to read those homecoming stories with love in mind. This morning, our, our scripture is in John. It's been read to you. I'm going to read it again. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. It's interesting. Um, you know, Jesus had spent a lot of his ministry talking about the great commandment of love. Love of God, love of neighbor. So why is it in John that we have a new command I give to you? Was, it's, it's like he, he wasn't saying this for the first time. So uh, scholars have thought and wrestled with that just a little bit. Um, and I, I think the answer lies in the context of, of that particular occurrence. Um, you may remember that this was right after the Last Supper. And what had Jesus done at the Last Supper? He had them all together, and he washed their feet, something he had never done before something that some of them felt pretty uncomfortable with. Uh, just flat out trying to refuse it. And he said, no, unless you accept this, you're not of me. And so they said, well, then wash. Wash away. That commandment was new in the sense that Jesus was demonstrating in an act of humility the first time in an intimate setting what he intended. By love. And he was about to demonstrate something that was even greater. He was about to demonstrate love by the giving of himself. Not only for those disciples, but for all of us. You know, we're supposed to pattern our lives after Jesus. In fact, an interesting uh, a little 
said that, that I, I learned not too long ago. You can search all of Scripture, and you won't find Jesus asking us to worship him. Certainly, all of Scripture is about our, the worship of God. But what Jesus asks us to do is to follow him, and thereby our worship. That may seem insignificant, but I think it's significant because the way that we demonstrate and accept and receive the love of Jesus is by demonstrating and opening ourselves up to others. You know, the church in our society these days is known for a lot of things, and in some cases, not all positive. In some cases, we've become known more for our declarations of who and what we're against than our declarations and demonstrations of love. We may have forgotten that love is a prerequisite to facing the matters that we face concerning individuals and relationships. We've aligned ourselves too closely with political parties and cultural moments forgetting that Jesus points us way beyond those, way beyond the temporal kingdom of this world to a love that is both demonstrated in the here and now and for all time and all places. We've become sometimes so concerned about our own particular set of, of circumstances, you know, like the, the dog hair and the thermostat, that we sometimes fail to see beyond our front door to the larger neighborhood where the homeless gather, where the stranger is looking for a welcome, where our neighbor's house is on fire. Folks, for love to be shared, it has to be demonstrated. A new command by Jesus, love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. On this homecoming day at Mars Hill, I'm thankful for this family. I'm thankful for the family that you have been to my family, for the testimony of so many among you who have reached out extended yourselves and then the hands and the feet of Christ to me, to my family, and to so, so many others. Thank you. May the God of all love and grace lead us as we strive to make our homes welcoming places. May we continue to be known for the love that we have for one another amidst the complexity so much so that love overflows beyond our doors into the neighborhood and outside. Thank you for those beautiful words and I think much to think about this church and talk about love. I haven't been here tremendously long, but I think about this church and the many things it has been as I've seen it over the years. In coming, uh, I remember too for all that this church was a place that we prepared meals to those that were hungry. I think about each Christmas in walking from the house to here, that this church is a place in which the social workers are able to gather, to be able to distribute things to those that are in need. I think about during the pandemic of how we were able to provide a place for a missionary and their fiance to come and have
have a wedding, even in the midst of the crazy time we were in, of how this place offers young people an opportunity and a chance to go either to camp or to come to Vacation Bible School or to come on Wednesday nights or, or Sunday morning and sit in a Sunday school classroom to be able to connect and learn the Word of God. I think of this church of taking a love offering when our daughter had surgery. It says help, help offset the bills. Church, thank you for being a place of loving kindness. We step into the gap. And I, you know, I think about it, that's what Jesus has really called us to. To step into the gaps of this world to show love, to touch hearts and lives, to give opportunities that others might not have. Charlie, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to come on and sit on sit on front of you here real quick. The the pandemic really has taken so much from so many. And um, this year, um, this year, I know many of our our High schools are offering um, their their graduations in a very normal fashion, but unfortunately, um, Ena River is is not affording that. And I thought, you know, it's bad not to be able to walk across the stage and be able to to receive that diploma that you've worked so hard for. Um, so this morning, what I wanted to do was give Charlie that opportunity. Um, he has grandparents actually overseas that are able to watch, to be able to see something that otherwise might not actually occur. Now in two weeks uh, I won't be here but I know Danny and Tracy are going to do a fantastic job honoring all of our graduates. But this morning what I wanted everybody to do is kind of get into a little bit of a different state of mind. Picture yourself, if you will, in a high school auditorium. You've heard of a lot of different speeches from students and principals alike. And then that one particular time comes up and all of the names are being read. And students are coming across the stage receiving their diploma. And then of course you hear the name you have been waiting to hear. Charlie Carter. present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You are dismissed. Thank you.